from Heterodox Academy. This is Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Conversations with scholars and authors. Ideas from diverse viewpoints and perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. Thanks for tuning in. I'm joined today by Julian Zelazar, historian at Princeton University. He's the co-author with Kevin Cruz of Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974. Kevin appeared on an episode of this podcast earlier this year. Julian is also the author and editor of several other books, including On Capitol Hill, a book about the struggle to reform Congress from 1948 onwards, Arsenal of Democracy, a book on the politics of national security, and The Fierce Urgency of Now, a book about Lyndon Johnson and the battle for the Great Society. He's also a frequent commentator in the international and national media, and he has a weekly column on CNN.com. He joined me on the show to talk about political polarization and the history of polarization. So we're here to talk about polarization. If you had to give a concise lecture on the history of polarization, you'd have to pick a place to start, and that's kind of tricky. So if you had to do that, where would you start in American history? Well, clearly, if you were doing the long view, you'd you'd include the late 19th century when the parties were incredibly divided um, and the level of partisanship from roll call votes to interaction between members of Congress was very intense. Uh, But I'm a 20th century historian, so I like to start in the 1970s. I think in terms of our modern polarization, the the kinds of uh, relationships and politics that we see in Washington, the 70s is really a takeoff decade for many reasons. Uh, But but that's where the path to today really begins. So what was it about the 70s and who were the seminal figures there that caused some of this polarization to happen? Well, uh, what we have to remember is in the 70s, there were a lot of young Democrats and even some Republicans who believed polarization was a good thing. Their main complaint about Washington was that bipartisanship had ruled the roost for many decades. And the way Washington worked was you had these bipartisan coalitions of Southern Democrats and Republicans who worked behind the scenes in committee rooms and smoke-filled convention halls to basically prevent uh, the Democrats from doing anything on civil rights, on uh, urban reform, on health care policy. So in the 70s, they were very enthused about strengthening the parties. Uh, and so there's a lot of reforms in the early 70s. The, the Watergate babies, as they're called, come into office in 1974 in the aftermath of, of Nixon's resignation. Uh, and many of them are, are very committed to making Washington a more partisan place. Uh, they work with senior Democrats like Richard Bowling uh, of Missouri and Phil Burton of California. And the main goal among Democrats is to strengthen the hand of party leaders, to make sure that leaders were strong enough that they could get every member in their party to vote a certain way, to act according to a certain party logic. Uh, and Republicans will do the same thing in the 1970s. Uh, People like Ronald Reagan are trying to make the Republican Party more united uh, and and more conservative as a whole. So on the issue of race, that's been an issue that's also brought up every time people talk about polarization. And it's undoubtedly been a central topic in American history. But overall, do you think people overweight or underweight race as a cause of some of the political divisions throughout American history? Well, I think it's a big it's a big cause. It's, It's a a source of tension and division that never goes away. I don't think it's the sole reason that you either have polarization after the 1970s, and it's not the sole explanation of modern conservatism. There are lots of issues at work. Uh, If you're looking at the history of conservatism in the modern era, you have to take seriously uh, national security and anti-communism. You have to take seriously the push to deregulate the economy and cut taxes. All of those were part of the mix as well. Uh, And partisanship wasn't simply promoted in the 70s somehow as, as part of a racial backlash. There were people from different parts of the spectrum who really believed strong parties were a good thing in America, not a bad thing. But uh, then there were parts of this political world that capitalized on racial division uh, throughout from the 70s right through today as a way to secure more support and to solidify support uh, among w- within their party. So if you're doing the history of the Republican Party, you can see this as early 
1968 and 72, where Richard Nixon in his campaigns is hammering away at law and order, uh, which which is about law and order, but it's also about the urban riots of the 1960s and, and a way to kind of mobilize support against what some Americans were seeing on television. You can fast forward to 1988. Uh, when Lee Atwater runs the famous campaign for George H.W. Bush, who's running for president against Michael Dukakis, uh, and he runs a series of ads. They're known as the Willie Horton ads that talk about a furlough program in Massachusetts, where Dukakis was from, uh, that allowed uh, an inmate, an African-American out, uh, who then uh, raped someone. Uh, and, and you see this constant use of race uh, throughout the period. So I think it's important in that way. I, I also think as we shifted in the 70s away from questions of explicit racism, meaning uh, segregation or explicit denial of voting rights towards questions of institutional racism, how race impacted criminal justice, residential patterns and more, uh, the partisan gridlock that you'll see in Washington really prevented any kind of serious progress on dealing with these issues. And another divisive issue is the New Deal. You can see even prior to the 1970s, some Republican leaders being angry about the New Deal and framing their policies around pushing back against that. How significant do you think the New Deal was in, in pushing polarization? Well, that's a, a massive moment, uh, meaning this is the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt's president, and he undertakes a pretty bold set of policies to get the country out of the Great Depression, but also to create a new kind of social safety net and regulatory framework uh, to guide American life. And, and the government is much bigger when we leave the FDR years than it was uh, when we started. And what people forget is this was not accepted by everyone in the country. It was a real struggle. Uh, and one main um, opponent for FDR, it wasn't just the Republican Party. Uh, part of the opposition comes from Southern Democrats, who in the late 1930s are increasingly concerned that the president is going to shift from economic issues to issues that explicitly deal with race relations in the South. Uh, there's an anti-lynching bill, for example, that they're very concerned about. Or when uh, Congress passes uh, a minimum wage law, they're very worried that new federal standards will allow the government to deal with racial segregation in the South. You have many business leaders in the 30s and 40s who are, are staunchly against what the president is doing. Uh, they see the threat he poses to their economic freedom and interests, uh, and they mobilize against him, funding conservative uh, causes and figures to fight the New Deal. So, so it's a very contentious moment. And, and I think the, the kind of groundwork that is laid by the New Deal of, of of a big, strong federal government has become a central point of tension in our politics. Again, it wasn't pure polarization like we know it today because the parties in the 30s were deeply divided. So you had bipartisan coalitions against FDR as opposed to a pure partisanship that we see today. And during the Cold War, people sometimes say that the, the common enemy of the Soviet Union was one thing that perhaps united the parties. And perhaps that did, but one effect it had outside the United States is that it caused both parties to be quite aggressive in pushing proxy wars in other countries, um, maybe trying to outdo each other in showing how strongly they hated the Soviet Union. So in a way, that lack of partisanship May, may have turned out badly for some countries outside the United States. So do you think there's a double-edged sword to this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, again, the, the reason there are so many people enthused with creating stronger parties in the 70s, because of, it was because of the problems that had uh, existed and the policy outcomes that had been produced by that earlier period that earlier era of bipartisanship. And so the Cold War is a perfect example. Uh, you had both parties and different coalitions in both parties here in the United States throughout the 40s and 50s in a political arms race, so to speak, to show that they were tougher on national security. Uh, and what happened is this constantly led to all sorts of interventions overseas and support 
for accelerations of military conflict like Vietnam uh, because of the political pressures in part that had disastrous consequences all over the world. When I teach about Lyndon Johnson, uh, this is a central theme for me in terms of how did we get into Vietnam and why did we escalate a war in 65 that most Americans didn't even know about? And, and so part of the answer is the standard domino theory, this fear among uh, U.S. policymakers that if one country, no matter how small, fell to communism, others would follow. But another was this intense political pressure that existed uh, in the U.S. to show that you were a hawk. And Lyndon Johnson always thought about this. And even when he was hearing privately about why Vietnam would be a disaster, and he himself understood the high risks of getting into the war, he was politically terrified of looking weak on defense. He thought it would undercut all his domestic reforms. It would make him vulnerable. Uh, and, and we actually accelerate our involvement in Vietnam with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in August of 64, right in the middle of the presidential campaign, when Barry Goldwater, the Republican, is attacking Johnson for being too weak and for not dealing assertively with communism. So, so uh, that that era uh, kind of uh, from our how we dealt with issues like race relations to our policies overseas is highly problematic, and we shouldn't look nostalgically to the period before the seventies. And I think Joe McCarthy also represents some of that, where he was a tool for the Republicans to appear strong as anti-communists. And then he also became a nuisance for the party once Eisenhower won. Very important. Um, you know, for a long time, McCarthy was always uh, discussed as something of an outlier. He was uh, this extreme part of American politics that emerges and does ugly things and destroys people's lives. And, and finally, you have the heroic moment uh, when, when the Republicans uh, and Joseph Welch, combined with some journalists and Democrats, all stand him down. But in reality, the more we've studied about it, we see the Republicans tolerated this. He was he was their attack dog. And many Republicans in Congress and even in the Eisenhower administration, they didn't like what he was doing, but they let him do it. Uh, and they they unleashed him because he he was part of an effort which we forget in the early 50s of Republicans trying to rebuild their party. Uh, they were still pretty devastated after the 30s and 40s. FDR had really just changed American politics and created this very politically awesome uh, coalition. And one of the issues they felt Democrats were vulnerable was the anti-communist issue. And so McCarthy might have done it in a way many Republicans thought was distasteful or unfair, uh, but they really let him do it until their own partisan interests no longer fit with the kinds of stuff he was doing. And since we're on the topic of foreign policy, one of the things that didn't make it extensively into fault lines is the issue of foreign policy. I believe you had to keep the book concise. But let's say you had to, the opportunity to add another 100 or 200 pages to the book about foreign policy uh, during the period from Watergate to the present. What would you want to add to the book? Well, I, I mean, we do have a lot in there and we're not uh, unhappy, Kevin and I, with, with with some of the issues we highlighted. So the ones we did get in are, are the politics of detente in the 1970s and and how you can see some of the political divisions domestically uh, starting to uh, line up with the tensions over foreign policy. We have on the 80s, for example, on Ronald Reagan, uh, first the huge military buildup uh, and importantly, the opposition to that buildup was something we really wanted to talk about, the nuclear freeze movement, which helped push Reagan toward the late 80s uh, toward some kind of detente. And we have about uh, the war in Iraq and obviously 9-11 and its aftermath. So so we have a lot in there. And I think uh, we're pleased uh, with how much we could get. But there's always more that you can do. Uh, certainly, I would. Uh, I think Kevin and I would love to do more on the 1990s, which is really a transitional period as the Cold War comes to an end. But we're not quite yet in the war on terror uh, post 9/11 period, and really unpack what was going on in American foreign policy and different directions uh, that we could have taken. I think that would have been uh, fantastic. Obviously, we have a, a bunch on the end of Vietnam. Uh, and the fall of, of Saigon to communism, but uh, to do even more about concrete impacts on foreign policy in the years that followed would be great. So the good thing is there's always future editions uh, where we can expand. But we did try to connect 
the story of foreign policy to the story of domestic politics as best we could. And one of the issues that's become salient now is Russia. When you teach this course, at this point in time, do you include more material on Russia and how Russia has become more powerful than we thought it would be? Yeah, I mean, I, I so so Kevin and I, we used to teach this class and then I teach it now myself, just pragmatically, we couldn't, we had to split things up. And so uh, I taught it about a year and a half ago. I'm on sabbatical this year. Uh, and and so I've been thinking about that. When I come back next year, uh, how, how do we uh, include, how will I include Russia in the current, very current period? My treatment of Russia usually really revolves around the 1980s. Uh, and, and that's a highlight of my course in, in terms of both uh, the buildup, as we have in the book, the buildup of the Cold War, the, the, the next phase in the early 80s where things seemed really dangerous. And by 83, it looks like we might even go to war uh, to the gradual collapse of the Soviet Union and the INF agreement. And so that's usually what I talk about. And then after that, I have Russia uh, either in or out of alliances in different military conflicts, but it's not a theme. Uh, and and even when I, the last time I taught it, and I talked about uh, President Trump's uh, initial months as president, uh, I talked about the scandal, but I do want next year, I think, to include a little more on the evolution of Russia, uh, both on the international stage uh, and in U.S foreign policy relations, because I think we're all waking up uh, to this new stage we are in, the new kinds of threats uh, Russia is trying to uh, provoke, and the different political, weird political alliances you see unfolding in the U.S. over this issue, where I don't even think the parties have figured out uh, exactly what what position they want to take. But, but I'm going to put more of it uh, just for the reason you're saying. And which historians right now do you think are doing some interesting work in that area, Russia specifically, whether it's historical books or academic papers? Yeah, it's, uh, my colleague Steve Kotkin is really the the best. He's he's been writing about Stalin, so he he goes back earlier. Um, but but his understanding of the roots of uh, of the Soviet Union and Russian political society, uh, I think, uh, are hard to beat. Uh, so a lot of what I learn. I learn either through his writing or by walking across the hall and, and schmoozing with him a little bit about what's going on uh, in in the news. Uh, another person, two people who've done good work, uh, both Tim Naftali and Jeff Engel, uh, who wrote a lot about George H.W. Bush. And both of them were really interested in the end of the Cold War and the transition and how George H.W. Bush handled that. So uh, Naftali has a short book on Bush for the Times presidential series. And Engel uh, has a, a, lo- a lengthier book that came out, I think, last year about Bush. And, and I think they're really useful. Um, in terms of the very contemporary developments, I'm really like everyone else learning uh, through a lot of the news and, and contemporary, contemporary uh, journalistic analysis about it. I don't know who the, who the historians are who are best capturing this yet. And at the end of Fall Lines, you say, for many Republicans, this is about the Donald Trump campaign, uh, quote, for many Republicans, the simple fact that Trump enraged Democrats proved to be enough reason to rally around him. Uh, Do you feel like that trend is now something that can conceivably be reversed now that a precedent has been set? Because even during the dire polarization of the 1990s, you didn't quite see presidential candidates like Bob Dole um, doing anything like that. Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, I I think one of the key points that we try to make, and I've tried to make in my writing, my op-eds, is that it's important to understand President Trump very much as a product of our era, and his strategy isn't simply to play to the base of his party, it's to play to the party. He counts and depends on the fact that polarization will hold Republicans in the Republican camp regardless of what the person up top does, uh, and that you're not going to see defections. And, and he's tested this uh, beyond anyone I've seen uh, in terms of how he acts and what he says and his willingness to go against certain orthodoxies of his party. Uh, what he knows is uh, time and time again, uh, he will just uh, provide some red meat to the party and, and they'll vote for him. And I think that's what he's counting on in 2020. 
I don't know if that uh, will hold. I still think it will. I, I think it's a it's a it's a very reasonable and actually rational understanding of how American politics works. Uh, the question is 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 the party as he envisions it just shrinking, uh, and and is the Democrat Democratic Party uh, capable of just building a bigger coalition because of numbers because of appeal, and and I don't have an answer uh, at this point. Uh, in terms of of where we'll be, but but I do think Republicans and that strategy are vulnerable, not because people are going to defect, just because the party is actually shrinking. Um, and one book people are talking about nowadays on this issue is How Democracies Die by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. They've suggested that the way democracies die is slowly through the erosion of democratic norms that have never been coded into law, and we can see. Uh, Mitch McConnell specifically eroding several norms that have once held uh, several people in political science and history have written about this, uh, Norm Ornstein, E.J. Dion. Um, when you look at this erosion of norms, where do you see that going? Do you see that continuing or do you feel like those norms can somehow be restored in the next decade? Not right now. The erosion of norms has been uh, really pretty striking uh, and, and once again, this is not something that starts with President Trump. I've been writing about this now for many years. Actually, for much of my career, this has been a theme, it, it, looking at Congress and how those norms and how those procedures and how the rules that once helped keep this very unwieldy institution uh, intact have fallen apart. And you see this at the presidential level as well. Uh, and, and each time you have a serious moment of erosion, it's very hard to undo. It, it's like public policy. Once they're in place, they're not easily dismantled. And the same holds true uh, when you take away certain norms that people followed, uh, even in the most contentious moments of American politics. I'm finishing another book that's coming out next year on uh, Newt Gingrich and the downfall of Speaker Jim Wright in 1989, which is when Gingrich really rises to power. And that's, for example, a key moment when a norm in terms of how far you go with political attacks is broken. Uh, and we never really get back from that uh, in terms of thinking of leadership and thinking of what's legitimate partisan warfare and what's illegitimate. And President Trump uh, now has has simply taken this broken system, a system where the norms were frail, and totally not only exposed it by showing how far you can go, uh, but also made it much, much worse by doing this uh, at the presidential level. And I don't think we're anywhere close uh, to a period of restoration. Uh, you really are going to need something like the 1970s, uh, when after Watergate and after Vietnam and after all the scandals we went through, you had a coalition of reformers uh, from groups like Common Cause and individuals like Ralph Nader to the class of 74, the quote unquote Watergate babies, who devoted a lot of time to trying to fix the way that politics worked, passing institutional reforms, legislation uh, that changed the ways we do business. Uh, they weren't always successful and, and we're now living with many of their failures, but they did devote a decade to that. And I think we're going to need a moment like that to really fix where we are, because right now every incentive in American politics points in the wrong direction. And it's very hard for even the best meaning politician to act differently uh, because the incentives are to play into the broken norms that we have today. And one of the trends you point to is the change in the 1970s of newspaper reporters becoming celebrities because of covering Watergate and then the uh, drive to be a celebrity if you're a reporter. In addition to that, you see the end of the fairness doctrine. Um, do you also see that trend worsening or do you see any hope for maybe something like the fairness doctrine coming back? Yeah, generally, uh, in part because I'm a historian, I, I'm never very optimistic about short-term fixes. And so so that is a good example. And in, in Fault Lines, we, we really look at the changes in the media as a long-term transformation. First, with the advent of cable news, uh, starting, we, we argue, in the early 80s, where you have a 24-hour news cycle. You also have cable television stations devoted exclusively to news, which changes uh, the commercial incentives that surround the news business. You have the 1990s then with the advent of partisan news and new uh, uh, norms of journalism 
uh, where open partisanship and reporting uh, are normalized. We talk about Fox News in 1996. And then the world of social media in the early 2000s, uh, with everything from Facebook to Twitter, where a lot of the editorial restraints and gatekeepers on the production of information about about news fall away. And anyone can get out there and, and go viral and, and put out information that might be right, might not be uh, accurate. And so all three of those have combined into creating this wild west of news coverage that I think we live in today. Uh, and it won't be easy to undo. Uh, the government doesn't have the strongest hand. Uh, as you said, the Fairness Doctrine was uh, eliminated in 1987. Probably wouldn't work today anyway. Uh, just because of the way we uh, receive information from so many outlets. Uh, and so a lot of this will require the producers of information, meaning television networks, online sites, and social media providers uh, who have a huge amount of muscle right now thinking of at least alternatives uh, to news, supporting efforts that provide us better information, uh, more analytical information, and at this point, there's not a lot of people doing that, and uh, it's hard to do. There's a reason. It doesn't, it's not easy to make money doing that, but I think that's where the solution is going to have to come, uh, and I, I hope we get there. I mean, the, the best effect of what we've seen in the last few years would be the soul-searching and a need for better news uh, emerges out of the rubbles of, of what's happened with President Trump and, and a lot of the breakdown of our public square. And one of the things I really liked about uh, Fault Lines is you draw on these movies that capture the zeitgeist. You mentioned Nashville, which is one of my favorite movies, and Network, and, and War Games. I actually saw War Games recently, thanks to the book. I hadn't seen it since I was nine years old, and it's a different movie when you're a nine-year-old, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, are there any other movies you show your class or you recommend to your class when you're teaching this course about history since 1974? Sure. I show, I show clips. So the class, when I teach it, I'll, it's a lecture course, but there's lots of uh, multimedia. And so I like to show clips uh, from different films. One year I showed a little bit of Wag the Dog, I remember, uh, which was a film that came out in 97. And, and in retrospect, it's pretty amazing to watch. It's about a presidential team that manufactures a fake war for television to cover up a sex scandal uh, of the president which comes out right in the middle of Clinton's impeachment. Uh, so it was a famous moment. So I show clips of that. I show clips of all the president's uh, men uh, to, to talk about the changing role of journalism and the interaction in the 70s of investigative journalism. I show television shows. I, I show clips, for example, of 24 when I'm teaching about post 9-11 and both uh, some of the uh, increased uh, you know, usage and acceptance of methods of interrogation that, like torture uh, that had been off limits and some of the synergy that starts to emerge between pop culture and actual practice, uh, which that show often encouraged CIA operatives, we've learned, uh, to, to handle problems in a certain way. So um, those are a few of the clips. I, I've shown more, uh, but those, those are some of the ones that I remember. Mm -hmm. And to wrap up, I want to come back to the syllabus. We talked about Russia. And what other ways do you see the syllabus of this course maybe changing over the next decade? Well, it won't. Uh, so far for me, I won't transform it. I'm pretty happy with the, not happy, but I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I feel good about the, the structure in that it really helps me and I hope my students understand where, where we are today. This class, like the book, had been structured and developed long before Trump became president, long before uh, the world we're living in today uh, was, was evident. And, and, and it kind of explains how we got here. So I don't want to tamper with it too much. Um, but, but there's things I'd like to add. I'd love to add much more. I have a little on criminal justice and race, for example, uh, from, uh, how policing, uh, has, has emerged as a, a center point of debate over how race plays out to the private prison system. I'd love to kind of carve out time to do more about the development of that uh, and how it unfolded. I'd love to do more, and I don't know how yet, on what's going on in the states. Uh, 
in terms of party politics and policy. That's hard to do always in a big class. You're always focused on the national level. But I think the story of the states is is really quite important. Uh, and I'd like to do more about that. And then I'd like to one last thing I that I think about all the time with President Trump is how so many of our norms among leaders are voluntary, meaning one of the most striking parts of President Trump is he always just does things that you think aren't acceptable or that someone's going to respond, but you can get away with a lot. And I want to look back at presidents as I teach them to think about that a little more, Uh, even our most contentious presidents about where they were willing to go and where they weren't willing to go and and why that's broken down so much. If that's just about President Trump or has this erosion uh, of, of presidential restraint also included not just their formal power, uh, but their willingness to go anywhere they need to go to win and to secure support. Uh, so those are the big issues. And then and then obviously themes like Russia, cybersecurity, uh, cyber warfare is something I'm really interested in, but I haven't yet really included in the course. Um, there'll be lots of places I think I can expand both the syllabus and the lectures. Well, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. You can find links to Julian Zelizer's website and several of his books, including Fault Lines, in the show notes for today's episode. My next episode features Jeffrey A. Sachs. He's a lecturer at Acadia University in Nova Scotia, and he writes about issues related to free speech on campus and whether there is indeed a free speech crisis. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps other people find out about the show. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.